Take a breath, step outside. Welcome to Indigenous Ways Wisdom Circle. Thank you all for being here tonight. We're just going to say one more time the Zoom etiquette. Uh, everybody's off now, so everybody's got it. Thank you very much. We want to say uh, thank you to all the ancestors, traditional caretakers of these lands. We are currently in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and around us and below us is uh, 19 Pueblos. So uh, we want to acknowledge that and all the caretakers from where you come from as well. And uh, Indigenous Ways is dedicated to bridging cultural exchange with people globally. And we're very grateful tonight to have a very, very special guest of honor, Arletta Tolan. She is a elder from the Navajo Nation. She comes from the community called Lukachukai on the Navajo Nation. And that is in the Arizona portion of the Four Corners. Arletta Tolan is uh, a woman that loves to honor the earth. She believes in the earth. She believes in Father Sky. She believes in animals, four-legged, two-legged, winged ones. She believes in trees. She believes in speaking to all of these elements. Arletta comes from a traditional family. Her parents were medicine people, mother and father, Navajo speaking. And Arletta is a fabulous teacher. And Arletta is able to live on the land in a way that many of us only wish we could oh, learn no. to do. And that is when electricity goes out for people in, in cities, people freak out. When their internets die, people freak out. But you know what Arletta does? She does no no fear. She just starts the fire outside and cooks. She's not dependent on any of technology today, which I think is beautiful. Anyways, there's a lot for us to learn from Arletta. So Arletta's going to share some of her story with us tonight. And like I said, when Arletta's done with her story, we're going to open it up. So thank you very much and welcome Arletta Tolan. Yay! Just checking that the interpreter is ready. <clears throat> Let me say hello to everyone to start. Hello. And yes, I am Arleta Toland, Arleta Toland, and I am Navajo. And at, from Edgewater Clan and Coyote Pass from La Cuchay, La Cuchacay, Arizona. I have two brothers and five sisters. I'm the third of the kids, of the children. And my parents couldn't speak English. They only spoke Diné language. And they only spoke Diné. My parents were farmers. They had horses and sheep and goats and hens and roosters and pigs and horses. And uh, we had horse-drawn plows. And what I would do is my brothers and I we would work on the horse plow. My brother would horn, hold the frame to the plow and I would get behind him and I would follow him. And what I had was corn seeds in a pouch and I would drop each seed behind him as he went ahead and plowed the earth. <laughs> and just to make sure the interpreter is clear, so I'm talking about plowing the dirt, plowing the earth, and my brother would hold on to the frame of the plow 
as it was connected to a horse and it was pulled along. And again, I went right behind them and I would drop the corn seeds as we went. Now my brother, he liked playing with the horse and he would tease the horse and he would let go of the plow and then the horse would kind of go off and go a little crooked and curve to the side and that would make my brother laugh a lot. He'd grab the frame again and bring the plow back in and we would do that back and forth while we were working all day and we'd go back and forth and I'll never forget those experiences. Also, my father was a medicine man as a sand paint, as sand painting is what he did. And so he would have some tan sand, really smooth, refined sand that he would place on a round disc. And there was also red sand that he had, white sand as well, and black sand. And using those different colors of sands, he would use them to design rainbows, snakes, uh, corn designs. He would do all sorts of designs uh, for painting on it. And uh, my father would also uh, have ceremonies that he would perform in. And he would have the drumstick and he would drum in ceremonies for healing ceremonies. And so for Now my mother, she would always ask us to gather firewood. And so we would collect the firewood and usually we would use that firewood for cookouts. Now we didn't have an oven. Mom relied on an open flame for all of our meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And my mom also had two pails let me make sure the interpreter gets that. Yes, my mom had two pails. My sister had two pails. And I also had two pails. And what we would do is the three of us would take a, a walk, probably just under a mile. And we wa would walk and fill our pails with water. And then we would carry them all the way back home. And we would do that about two or three times a day. As soon as our water ran out, we'd pick up the pails and buckets. And there we were back and forth. And we did that for a long time until my dad ended up getting an old fashioned, well, it was actually two barrels, two wooden barrels, the old kind that were fastened together with the metal rings, if you understand what I'm talking about. And so he would take those and hitch them on the wagon. And then he would take the wagon over and use the wagon to fill the barrels. And then as I grew up and got older, that's what we ended up doing for the water. Um, and another thing we would do is we would pile up sheepskins, food, and all that into the wagon, the horse-drawn wagons, and then at the same time, my uncles and brothers would go ahead and take all that equipment and go out to the livestock with the sheep, and they'd go out in the wild up on the mountain, and they would uh, work the herd and I would ride with my family and we would stay up on the mountain and we were there uh, and that was typically in the fall that we would spend all that time up there uh, and then return after that and I must say that we were very poor in the fact that we had a one-room Hogan and I slept uh, on lambskin sheepskin and just on a dirt floor. And, and that was how my life went growing up. And I'll never forget that my sister showed me how to take bugs out. And it was a certain type of bug. It was a cicada. And uh, you have to actually decapitate them. You have to take their, their wings off, their head off, their arms off, and then their legs. And then what you do with those pieces is you go ahead and crunch on them because they're really good. Uh, and so my sister and I would do that. And when she would hear one, she would say, there it is. And so I would find Coke bottles. And then I would end up putting all those bugs into the Coke bottle until it filled up. 
And then what we would do is we would take that filled up bottle to my mom and mother would go ahead and cook that and we would have a meal out of it and we would eat bugs. But I must say they were delicious and I, that's something I could never forget. Also, my brother and I, we knew how to go ahead and put a bridle on a horse. So we knew how to fasten that to a horse and go ahead and make all the, the connections to the wagon. And then again, we would load up the wagon with camping items, dishes, clothes, materials that we would need, hay even. And then we would go ahead and ride the wagon for a while, about 25 miles away. And there we would go to the squaw dances, the squaw dance ceremonies. And I remember when we'd get there, all the folk would park where the horses would face each other in a giant circle and there would be a giant flame in the middle. Uh, and then towards the outer edge, uh, there was a shelter side uh, and they would put up logs kind of like I'm showing like that and in V's and then drop them on top and kind of make them in order. And so what that would do is that would delineate where the families would be and where the ceremonies would be. And so people could come visit and provide their gifts uh, like flour, uh, chairs, uh, tobacco, sugar, lard, candy, soda, watermelon. They were offerings that were shared you know, to family and to the in-laws too. Uh, and so also a medicine man, and if there was anyone sick, would be in the Hogan and they would perform the ceremony for them there. And it would be usually a week long uh, event until the last day when we would all come together and we would face the Hogan and the door would open. And usually what it was is somebody would come out and they would, of course, give out items like candy, soda bottles, and sometimes they just toss the candy. I remember catching some a couple times. Sometimes they'd go way over my head, way beyond me, and people were just very excited as it all whizzed by us. And the medicine man there would perform a ceremony uh, while the Hogan is behind him. And I remember that collecting candies and always at the end having a, a pouch full of candies. And then at that, we would go home When I was 11 years old, my father passed away. Now I was born in a log cabin. And when I was one year old, I became very sick. I ended up with a very bad fever and I almost died. Now that fever caused me to become deaf. There was a priest, a Catholic priest that ended up helping my parents uh, to find a deaf school. And I was four years old when that happened and I was taken to a school for the deaf and blind. And I remember crying so much because I was extremely homesick. And one of the counselors found a Pima girl to accompany me and when that happened, I had some relief and I felt much better and I had someone to share the time with. Now we did that for a couple of weeks. And in that time, I learned how to sign. I socialized a bit more because of that and I picked up sign language. And now talking about the classroom, there was a device that was about this big, kind of a little square box. And uh, that had some earphones attached to it and I would put the earphones on and then there was two knobs, uh, volume knobs. There was a low knob and a high knob. And I would use those to adjust them to try to hear the teacher as she spoke. There was a black chalkboard in those times and she had words written on there and she would say them and say them and say them and ask me to repeat them. However, I never understood what the words were. Uh, so after spending some time doing that, the teacher realized that she had to sit with me and what she did then is she had a balloon that was inflated 
And again, I had the earphones on again with the machine connected to the machine. And she would say ball and then pass me the balloon and I would say ball. And then we would pass it back and forth and I would fail and fail and fail. So after that, they sent me to another class where I didn't have the earphones on at all. And in that class, the teacher was using sign language very slowly, so slowly that we would get bored and we wouldn't pay attention. I have to admit, I did learn some things there, but not too much. So I was there at that school for about nine months. And in those nine months, I had different foster parents that whole time. Uh, and then I was out for Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, those typical holidays. Uh, and one of those foster parents on one occasion had a deaf daughter and her name was Patty. And I ended up staying with them. And they also had a horse ranch themselves. And Patty was a late sleeper. <laughs> I remember trying to wake her and I would often get frustrated and I would just go to Patty's mom and say, can I ride the horse? So then Patty's mom would come and say, hey, Arlita wants to ride the horse, wake up, Patty. And so Patty would have to wake up, get dressed, and we'd go out and boy, did I ever love riding. We would just ride and ride. And uh, Patty's neighbor, they also had horses. And what we would do is we would spend the time racing each other on the horses all the time. And I must say some time went by, almost a decade, almost 11 years, and the teacher was still signing slow. And by the time I was 11, uh, I ended up with a deaf teacher. That deaf teacher showed up in my life and it was an exciting time for me. What she would do is she would show us videos and we would watch the video and there'd be a person, a woman, I remember speaking sign language. They would turn off the video and then that deaf professor or teacher would ask, what did you just see on that video? And so I would repeat what I saw and what I thought was said. And she'd say, you're right, very good work. And so that was very exciting. But then a couple months after that teacher passed away, which was very sad. And then a new teacher came in place and that was another slow, boring teacher. <laughs> uh, and then the next year when I was 12, still young, right? Uh, and, and another young teacher uh, came in and I remember watching the teacher and there was a student that tapped me on the side and said, what did she just ask us to do? So I explained it to the student and then they tapped me again and said, what does this word mean? And then the person next to me on the other side tapped me and said, can you help me with this? Pretty soon everybody was tapping me left and right and I wasn't paying attention anymore. <laughs> so a couple of years went by and then I had that same teacher again. And she approached me and she said, there's two teachers in the classroom, you and I, and we kind of laughed about it because she had noticed that. And so that's, again, another memory that I won't forget. Now, when I was 13, I ended up going home and my mom hosted a Furby ceremony. The interpreter might have that wrong. A pervy ceremony, purity ceremony, where I was able to dress uh, with my clothing and, and uh, traditional clothing. And there was a medicine man with me in the Hogan. And he explained to me what the ceremony would be like. He explained the steps so that I would understand. And so the next day, early, early in the morning, it was outside and I was running with my cousins, siblings were all behind me and I was running in the front and everyone behind me kind of like this, you see my hands, I was the one in the front. And so there I was going ahead, scooting far ahead. And my brother was trying to catch up 
And uh, he was saying that I was embarrassing, that I should slow down and not be so far ahead. So we did that before coming into the Hogan, which I did. And when I got in there, there was dry corn bags, six or seven, I think, six or seven dry corn bags placed inside, which I found interesting. And so my mom was showing me, she picked up a piece and put it in the metate. And then she began crushing it and she began working it and she put another piece of corn in there in the metate and she kept on uh, working it and working it and smashing it until it became flour. It, it became flour and so she, we did that all day long. I did that with my aunts, my mother helping me. And again, this is the purity cere puberty ceremony. Uh, and so we did that all day into the second day. And again, very same thing the second day, early in the morning, we went out for that run again with my siblings and cousins behind me once more. We did a long circle and came back. And then I started working with the metate again, working with the corn again and grinding it down all day long, grinding it into flour. And then what happened for the third day of the puberty ceremony was the same thing again. Ran out, we went for our run pretty far, made it back. We went farther this time and uh, came back, worked the metate again with the corn, making it into flour, grinding it into flour. And by that time we were all done. So we took what had been ground into a bin with hot water. And then once the hot water was poured into it, I had a big ladle and I started stirring it and stirring it. And then there was raisins that were added to it. So raisins and sugar, some sweetening, and I started stirring and stirring, we stirred. And then after that, I sowed corn. It was corn scaffolds, looks like, it's corn husks. I sowed corn husks together into two sheets. Meanwhile, the men were outside and they were digging and plowing. And what they were doing is they were making a pit kind of a deep pit, almost three, four foot deep round pit. And so what they did in the pit is they put, would put a fire in the pit and that was gonna be later in the night. And so back to what I was doing, stirring again, that corn that we had just made into flour with that combination. And so we would take it out. And then what I would do with it is pour it into the pit. And the pit usually would already be heated at that point. So then we would, cover it with ash, coal, and more fire, and place it on top of that corn uh, combination. And the men would watch it the whole night. And I would stay inside the Hogan with the medicine man pr doing prayers uh, until the next day, which would be the fourth day. And on the fourth day, again, another run, even further than the days before, farther, farther away, much longer run. And we would go the same, me, siblings and cousins, and return. And on the return, I would stand at the pit. And at that point, it had become a cake. And I would pray and also sprinkle to the north, south, west, east. And then after that, people would come forward to the pit. And what we would do at that point is cut a slice out of that corn cake and then share that with the people present. And again, that's the last day of the puberty uh, ceremony. And I was not allowed to eat sugar or sweets for four days. And the reason for that, again, is because it's part of the puberty ceremony, which honors and celebrates becoming a woman, including responsibilities for cooking, uh, for uh, weaving rugs, for planting and, and sowing seeds and growing stuff. And, and that was pretty much the heart of the puberty ceremony. I'd also like to talk about high school. I did go all four years. And I was told by my professors and teachers that I had good sign language skills. As far as grades, I got good grades. And I also was on the honor roll and I got some honorable awards as well and recognitions. 
And at the same time, I also worked as a host, a hostess. Uh, I would study and I would do waitressing and, and hostess work. Now, when I was 17, I didn't end up going home. I stayed out and I worked at the deaf school. Uh, and what I did is I ended up cleaning the halls, the desks, the tables, the chairs in the room. Remember, it was a school for the blind there. And uh, the, some of the students that they were blind would touch the walls in order to move around and navigate. So it would sometimes get a little messy and dirty. And so I would do that or did that during that summer to save up some extra money and ended up working there uh, at the school. And I graduated in 1973. And the money that I had then helped me pay, uh, helped, helped me pay for an apartment that I ended up getting on my own. So looking back on those memories, I remember a uh, library uh, uh, being interviewed uh, for standing against that teacher that signed really slow. <laughs> and I was one of the persons that was in agreement that uh, they should hire someone that is fluent in American Sign Language and not slow because I felt like having a slow signer was actually an impediment to me developing my signing skills. I needed someone fluent so I could be fluent. And also at home, you know, I missed out on that home life. I learned from my family, the corn grinding machine and using that to make tamale mix. And then actually making the tamales. I didn't know that that was an indigenous thing. I, I didn't see that at the school. Also something else that I missed out on was dry sumac seeds. Those seeds are also used in a grinder to make hot chocolate. And I never knew that, I missed out on that. Another thing is pine and nuts, pine and nuts. Pine and nuts you just find and, and, and you can eat, but I didn't know that way until 1984, 1985. I said, oh, pine and nuts. I did not know about pinon and nuts, pinon, pine and pinon, <laughs> the interpreter's trying to get that right. I didn't know about those nuts, but now that I look back, one thing that I find is different is that we don't have horse wagons anymore. We don't have horse plows to till the earth anymore. All of those practices have changed. And my family, on my mother's side, they didn't speak English. They always depended on my sister and asked her to re-say something or to tell the family what folks were saying in English. And that was the way it was my whole life growing up. And to be honest, I didn't like staying at the school for the deaf for nine months at a time because I wouldn't see my parents and I felt like I needed them. I needed to be close to family and I needed to have a school that was within driving distance. I would have really liked that. And I know uh, that there are no deaf schools. Well, at that time, there was no deaf school on the res with dormitories. And I understand that that was a, an issue. I want to say thank you because I'm finished. All right, thank you very much, um, Arletta. That was uh, really amazing uh, for all of us to hear your story and 
what life looks like, feels like, tastes on the Navajo reservation, which is so beautiful and something to be so cherished, acknowledged, remembered, honored, and sustained. So really grateful, Arletta, that you're able to stay on your homeland, stay on your family's land, stay connected to your various clan members, and be a part of the Lukachugai community, the Greasewood community, the Tsele community, T-S-A-I-L-E, the Wheatfields community, the Chinle community, all those wonderful places that uh, we call home, Arletta. So um, very, very proud of you uh, for sharing your story with us tonight. And uh, thank you for sharing your deep, deep truth and what really matters to you. I wanted to hear so much more, Arletta, but this was good. So thank you very much, everybody. Before we start inviting everybody back on this evening, I just want to do a quick commercial break. And we are going to have next week Joshua Dixon. And he is uh, a youthful Navajo artist that attends the Institute Amer of American Indian Arts, also known as IAIA. And he's a multi-genre multi artist. He does sand painting. He does traditional uh, songs and all kinds of stuff. So he's going to talk to us next week. That's really exciting. So. We're glad for that, and we also want to thank our ASL interpreters. Um, and those of you that want any information about Joshua, you can go to indigenousways.org. And there's also more Wisdom Circle presenters to take a look at and research as well. All of our virtual events have ASL interpreters and are free for everybody to view and utilize uh, how you see fit. And we want to thank our sponsors. Uh, we wouldn't be doing this without people and organizations that believe in what we're doing. We have the National Endowment of the Arts, uh, West Staff, West Staff Cares, New Mexico Arts, New Mexico Humanities Council, and National Endowment of Humanities. And as always, we are so grateful to our amazing Indigenous Ways board members that often join our circles as well and certainly help us steer this amazing ship in the desert called Indigenous Ways. And we also wouldn't be doing our things, events, our runs to Black Mesa without our individual donors, which a lot of them are coming off this platform. So thank you also. And if you're looking at this live or watching the record, please be sure to like and or subscribe to our social media pages, which uh, is flashing across the bottom of the screen. And um, we would love for you to su subscribe to our weekly newsletter at our website, which is really easy, indigenousways.org. The beautiful thing about this website, which has been developed by Elena and some of our uh, other supporters is it's very user friendly so you don't have to spend two hours trying to figure out how to find information on the website it's very user friendly um, we also like to mention that we have a wonderful blues legend that's going to be performing for the um, Lensic Theater who we're co-partnering with uh, Keb Mo is a three-time Grammy winner uh, please buy tickets, or five-time Grammy, Grammy winners, uh, pardon me, and uh, the Lensic Theater is so wonderful because they're partnering with not just Indigenous Ways, but three other local nonprofit organizations. Uh, that's really wonderful. And last, uh, the, I'd like to mention, in case you're interested in our nonprofit and want to support us, please donate. It's really easy to uh, go to PayPal or go to uh, indigenousways.org forward slash donate. There's also the postal address you can take a look at as well. And uh, last but not least, we are going to be doing another run up to Black Mountain. And the good news about Black Mountain is that last week, the Navajo Nation president and a whole crew of his entourage went up to the Kitsili chapter house that serves 
Oak Ridge Forest Lake and um, uh, Kitsili and delivered boxes of food and uh, sanitary stuff so water as well so the spotlight is on Black Mountain and thanks to Indigenous Ways that's been wonderful we're going to be going in October so we'll uh, start uh, accepting donations for that to be dropped off here at our garage as well and we'll take as many rides up there as we need to get the food up to the Kitsili Chapter House. So if you want to be involved with that, please do. And last but not least, um, bring uh, everybody can go ahead and join our platform now. Go ahead and take your screens off and let's chat. We've got plenty of time. And uh, go ahead and unmute yourselves. And the camera, you can turn your camera off so that we can see you. Uh, turn your camera on, pardon me, so that we can see you. And we'll just do the best we can with uh, everybody wanting to talk at the same time to Arletta and thank Arletta for her wonderful, wonderful story tonight. Uh, social media is such a wonderful tool. So uh, we've also got a bunch of messages on Facebook. If you're in social media. If you're in social media, uh, go ahead and uh, uh, come on in, everybody. Okay, um, who would like to share first? Christina Bueno, did you want to talk? Okay, sure. Hello, everybody. Am I ready to start? Okay. Hi, everyone. I am just so, so thankful um, for Arletta joining this evening and just sharing her life story. She is an amazing teacher, and I'll tell you how I met Arletta some time ago. Well, actually, let me start by just telling you a little bit about myself. So when I learned about the Native way of life, I was 18 years old. Um, you know, I was in from the hood and kind of learned that way of life. Um, and I was fascinated with the indigenous way of life. Um, it was just kind of par part of my religion, I guess, that I picked up along the way. Um, and so I, you know, learned also through books. Um, I've also learned uh, by going to various international conferences. Um, I believe there was one that I went to in, in the 2000s, early 2000s. But I met Arletta um, because I saw her telling a story about her beliefs and her way of life and her connections to Father Sky and Mother Earth. And I remember thinking that is exactly what I've been looking for because she shares similar thoughts. Um, that's exactly how I view my own life. Um, I enjoy nature, I enjoy Mother Earth and I enjoy Father Sky. And I listened to her tell her story and she taught me so much. She has been a wonderful teacher, and I wish that I would have known her prior to that point in my life. And of course, it's never too late. But I'm so happy to, uh, to meet her, and I'm so happy to hear her story tonight. She is an inspiration to me, and I so, so cherish her. I mean, just when it comes to finding somebody that is a spiritual fit, um, there's no one better than Arletta. So um, having the opportunity to meet her 
was amazing. Um, and I also had the opportunity to spend some time with her um, during the summer. Because of the pandemic, um, she wasn't able to get back to her homeland. And so she ended up staying with her son for a bit, which I begged her to do. And so, of course, I took advantage of that opportunity virtually to then have more conversations with her and to learn more from her before she goes back to her homeland where they don't have this type of technology or electricity. But she's such a beautiful person. Um, and I think anybody that knows her comes to appreciate her so much. So I just like to say thank you so much, Arletta, for coming. And thank you so much for allowing us to just walk in your beauty. Thank you, Tosh, and thank you, Elena, for inviting Arletta to be our presenter tonight. And thank you so much for the wonderful interpreters as well and your service. So I guess that is probably all that I have to say. I will wrap it up with that and let somebody else share. Okay, who wants to go next? Thank you. Who wants to go next? Anybody? Carla, would you like to say something? Or no, James Woodenlakes. Okay, JW. Yeah. All right, JW. Hi. Hello, everyone. Good evening. You're such a valuable person, Arletta. Um, I remember when I met you, I was taken aback and so very humbled. Um, just to have the opportunity to talk with you and to hear your stories. Um, you and I are a lot alike in a lot of ways. Um, and I missed the, the turtle story. So I don't know if you still have that one, um, that one and then also the other story that I enjoy hearing. And Arletta is saying, yes, I still tell those stories. <laughs> Um, with this pandemic, um, I'm not, sh I wish you were staying here in Albuquerque or that you were at least able to visit. I understand that you have to be cautious during this time, um, but I so value your stories. Love you much. You are a wonderful, wonderful person. Cheers, says Christina. Cheers, cheers. Thank you very much, James Woodenlegs, JW. Um, Hilda had her hand up. So Hilda, would you like to share? Which is signed Christine Violet. Oh. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your story, Arletta, and sharing about your culture and your experiences growing up with your family. Um, I just, I appreciated it so much. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Tosh and Elena as well, um, for making this possible to have Arletta here with us tonight. Thank you all. Love you much. Love you, Hilda. Thank you very much for your support. And uh, I definitely want to give some uh, Acknowledgement to Carla, who was our speaker the last month. Carla, would you like to say some words tonight? Carla, did you want to talk? Hi, 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 hi. Yes, so I just finished seeing you, Arletta, not too long ago. Um, and I hate that I missed the, the beginning portion of your story. I actually was teaching a class um, and I finished the class and tried to hurry and get off of that class meeting and then join this one um, to catch part of your story. But I will definitely look back at the recording so that I can hear your whole presentation. Um, I caught the end of it, which was fascinating. Um, so you were sharing about um, go, becoming a woman and the puberty ceremony. And that's such an important point. Yeah. 
that information um, really needs to be shared. And I know that it's shared in different ways for different cultures as far as how we become women. Um, I've heard different stories. And so I really wanted to hear more, Arletta. I wanted to hear more on that topic. And I, I look forward to, again, watching the whole recording. I will see you soon. Love you much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So this is Tosh. Thank you very much, Carla. And uh, for those of you that want to hear Carla and Terry Vincent's story, they're archived in our website. It's very, very compelling. Um, and James Wooden Lakes is in there as well. So uh, I, I see. Uh, Sarah, yeah, Sarah Young Bear is in there also. Thank you, Carla, for catching that. And Sarah's amazing. We've got plenty of time for everybody to speak, but uh, somebody else had their hand up. I think it was Sarah Youngbear. Christine? I think that was Christina. You go first. But I can go ahead and talk. So I'm so inspired, Arletta, by the sh story that you shared, especially when you talked about becoming a woman. Um, I went through the same process, and it really brought back memories. Um, I look forward now to sharing those same traditions with my daughter, as I, too, value our culture. Um, so you really just, I think, made people think um, about how much culture should be cherished. And I want people to see that we're still here, that we still follow the same traditions. Um, and your story in that right was very inspirational for us. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your time and thank you for sharing. I so appreciate it. And I look forward to more. Um, I do. I, I'd like to get your advice. I'd like to learn more about you. I'd like to hear more from you. Um, I, I'd like to be involved more with you and your people, you know, through Tosh and Elena and Indigenous Ways um, and these events. I just, I've appreciated participating in all of these virtual events. And we do have wonderful interpreters that do a great job. I'm so proud of you, Arletta. Love you, love you, love you. All right, just so you uh, just want to do a little add that every month we like to feature um, a deaf person of color. So we've been really blessed to have a whole array of deaf people of co uh, deaf people with something to say once a month. So keep keep posted on that. So um, okay, who who else wants to talk? We still have uh, about twelve minutes. Ah, um, Christine, yeah. Go ahead, Christine Bueno. Yes, it's me again. I see my ASL student here this evening. Do you have any questions that you'd like to ask Arletta or anything that you'd like to know about her? Slow teachers will drive you nuts. They did me growing up. All that time, I needed your a, voice. Fluent, a fluent signing teacher that would sign skillfully. So your ASL teacher, my ASL student is here. Any questions you'd like that's to ask? Me. That's me. So if you can interpret for me, that would be awesome. My Go name ahead. is Anne. Uh, Arletta. Your story was amazing and very relatable because uh, I, um, my son uh, was born premature and I found out he was deaf when he was one and a half years old, got his first hearing aids at three and then he started to go to the school for the deaf in New York City, uh, J47. And uh, so I could relate to you uh, using the box, the, the SM box. I remember he would wear this box. And I remember uh, taking out videos so that I could learn the little bit of sign that I could with the video by myself 
because I was a single mother. Um, but your story is, is so beautiful because um, I, think, I think progress in technology is good, but to be honest, sometimes I, I wish we wouldn't have so much technology. You know, it, sometimes it, it interferes with, with being in person and, and being there for each other. Um, I, I loved your, your story too about your, your puberty ceremony. That also struck with me because I, I'm a Puerto Rican and come from the tradition of the quinceanera where you celebrate at 16 your womanhood and there's a nice party that goes along with it. So um, those are great, great memories. And um, I think you're right. There, there's, I remember my son having wonderful teachers, but I also remember him having not so wonderful teachers. And I think those are missed opportunities when you go a whole year not being taught properly. And uh, so um, I'm, just, I'm just so grateful to be here. I, I'm grateful that Christina Bueno is my ASL teacher. And so I'm gonna get to learn more how to speak in sign language. I have three grandchildren now because my son is now 30. So I have to learn quickly. <laughs> I lost a lot of practice because I'm not around him a lot. But thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Christina, for inviting me. Thank you so much, Mary Ann. This is Tosh. And I definitely uh, wanted to ask really quick, there's several people I want to hear from. I'm sure you all want to hear from too. But Terry Vinson, would you like to say something? TV. Hi, Arletta. Can you see me okay? I see you. Love, I'm sending you love. Okay. Um, Okay, sorry, I just had to make an adjustment here. Um, I have known Arletta since 1995. Is that right, Arletta? 95, 96? Right. Yeah, 95. 1995? Okay. Um, so I met Arletta and was immediately fascinated um, with her. I mean, as a Native American deaf woman from Arizona, um, who grew, I also grew up um, going to deaf and deaf institute as well. And so I was just fascinated. Um, you know, it, it's hard to explain the beauty of, of what I experienced. Um, it's hard to explain the beauty of even Santa Fe compared to Albuquerque. Um, and so I would just, and Arletta's home is so beautiful. I've actually visited her several times. Um, and as I get to know her more and more and understand more about her upbringing and her history and her culture, I am just so amazed. Um, and I become even closer to my friend. Um, she's come to stay at my place. I've gone to stay with her for a few days each time. And I've so just enjoyed the closeness that we've experienced. And also Carla talked about um, womanhood and becoming a woman. My mother and my, my father got divorced. Um, so I remember learning about becoming a woman from my sister. 
I'm so impressed um, with the Native American ceremony. Um, and also, uh, Marianne was talking about her, her customs as a Puerto Rican. It's so important and so valuable um, to pass those traditions on and to be role models for the young girls as they grow up and become women. Um, because you know, we all one day will we'll have our own families that we can pass those traditions on to. And it's so important again for them to learn. You know, my mother and my sister are, are now gone. And so I now socialize with other women um, that are supports for me and that I can be supports from, um, supports to, excuse me. Um, and James Wooden Legs talked about the two turtles. Um, I am also familiar with and feel a connection um, to those stories and to Arletta. Native American wisdom really just makes you slow down in life and take account of your space. You know, it's not just about the hustle and bustle of city life. Um, there are deeper connections in that. And when you think about stories like the turtle versus the hare, right? Slow and steady um, wins the race. So I learned, I've learned so much from you and I will always cherish our friendship. Thank you so much, Arletta, for sharing with us this evening. I know that you were nervous. I'm sending love your way. <laughs> you, Mary. Yes, love. Thank you. Amazing, TV. Thank you very much, TV. Thank you, Tosh. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, interpreters. Thank you very much. And I am so amazed that Michelle Michaels, is that you, Michelle, from Arizona? I met you at the Cowgirls Hall of Fame with our interpreter, Bonnie. Is that you? Would you say yep. some words, please? Are you still with the Arizona Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing? I am. Yes, awesome. I am. <laughs> it's great to be here. <laughs> wow. It's amazing to see you. Thank you. How's it going? Good to see you. I'm I'm good. That's wonderful. <laughs> Would you like to say anything about Arletta tonight? Well, Ar Arletta, it's just so such a pleasure to meet you and hear your stories, and you know, just to learn more about your culture and your experience growing up um, as a deaf Navajo and going to the school. So, just thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. I really appreciate it. Gosh, Michelle, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This means a lot uh, to us. Uh, we actually want to be in touch with you also. So uh, does anybody want to share anything else tonight? Thank you all. This is all very exciting. Uh, Veronica, go for it. Oh, jeez. Uh, forgive me. I'm a bit shy. I'm kind of new to these events. So, um, um, Arletta, I felt, um, I felt a connection to your story because your, uh, your connection with family kind of reminds me of my connection to my own family. Um, three generations of our family are kind of like really close. We, we, all, we all live, three generations of family all live near each other. And we would help each other out. We, we're all very close. We're all, we all communicate with each other a lot. And we're kind of like, we help each other out in times of like sort of um, these, uh, some, some sort of stressful times like this pandemic. We were going through like uh, some uh, financial troubles and uh, we need to save money, so our family, my grandparents, um, all helped out and uh, got us like and, uh, got us stuff like uh, food and other and uh, other uh, goods, medicines, um, <laughs> things, so that we can uh, stay safe and secure. I hope I'm saying this right. 
So, like I said, my family and I are really close, and I appreciate that, and that's why I felt a connection to you. So, thank you, Arletta, for sharing us your beautiful life story. And I am actually also a student of Christina Bueno. So, I'd like to thank Professor Bueno for um, inviting me here today as well. Thank you to both of you. Thank you very much, Veronica. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you. And Richard had his hand up, so Richard? Well, if you put me on, uh, on uh, speaker view, if you look out the window, I don't know if you can see, but there's nothing but smoke. If you go on the internet, you can see how bad it was. At noon today, it was almost like six o'clock in the morning. Been that way all day. So pray for the native people up here in California. Their lands are burning. Their homes are in jeopardy, along with everybody else. So, you know, my heart is breaking because you see the damage, and this is only September. We've got to go through September, October, and November. This is our fire season, as you guys know. So I, I, I'm sorry I missed uh, the beginning of this. I was absorbed in something else, and I realized I was missing it. I'm going on land, online. I want to hear Arletta. She looks like a wonderful, wonderful person. I would like to meet her. Uh, I, I love, I love the way she looks. She's, she's got that, that regal look, that that thing that I've always loved about Native women when they stand straight, and they stand regal. And you see them in the powwow when they dance. You know that is a woman. And I, I'm. So I'm sorry I missed that part. I don't want to hog, but as you can see, it's very bad out here. So keep keep the native people up here in your minds. Thank you, Richard. And uh, if there's nobody else that wants to share tonight, I just want to thank everybody that has joined us tonight. Thank you for joining us on Zoom. And I also especially want to thank everybody that joined us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, we will be posting this show tomorrow within 24 hours yeah. along with the newsletter to talk about it. Please join us next week for Joshua Dixon. He is an amazing, amazing young old soul. He's a very, very special young man and I'm so honored. We're so honored to have Joshua next week. So uh, let's all keep the prayers going for people that are experiencing ravaging fires in California. We're sending out prayers to uh, everybody that's suffering right now. Let's, uh, let's, all, let's all just give what we can and send good light to people out there that are hurting. And um, just want to thank our ASL interpreters. You are all so amazing. I have such respect for you both, Chandra and Chris. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, all of you, we love you. We love you very much. You all take care of yourselves, and we'll look forward to seeing you back here next Wednesday, 6 o'clock Mountain Daylight Time. Oh. Later. And lastly, let's say thank you to Arletta. Good job, Arletta. You're a natural. Okay, as we say, Hagoshi. A hehet, I is a bear, a dahol here, a jogo. That means, okay, all of you, let's walk in beauty. Until next time, a yo no shine, we love you. Touch the earth, touch the earth, touch the earth.